Turkey, and I'm sorry I'm not the Turkish ambassador. I'm not a uh, diplomat and I'm not an artist either, but I am a scholar and a researcher and I have been very lucky over the last five years to be leading a um, vast project that's put me in contact with a lot of artists and performers and some diplomats along the way as well. So what I'm hoping to do today is just tell you a little bit about this work and by talking about it to question and problematise the ways in which we think about cultural diplomacy and particularly how we often think about cultural diplomacy as being something that happens in kind of between nations, enacted by individuals, but something that forges um, relations between nation states. I want to problematise that and think about forging relations between indigenous nations, which are not the same thing as nation states, and to tell you about how um, my project and the people that I'm in touch with through that are uh, enacting um, moments of diplomacy and what I might call counter-diplomacy, um, but which works towards the same kind of cultural dialogue. So on the, the slide you have up here, um, you're getting the first public sneak preview of our publicity for an exhibition that I'm holding at the Barge House uh, in about eight weeks' time. It's, um, the Barge House is just behind Oxo Tower, which some of you will know, on South Bank. The exhibition will be bringing together Indigenous contemporary arts from the various countries that my team is working in, so across the Americas, North and South, Australia, Pacific and South Africa. And we're approaching this as both a, um, a public education project, um, the kind of arts event that we want to be um, exciting and uh, sensual and beautiful and all the things that we feel the arts do and at the same time something that is a, a research um, by practice project insofar as the exhibition itself is a test of both how we might exhibit performance which is kind of a contradiction in terms because normally performance is happening live ephemeral in the moment an exhibition is trying to capture something project it or place it on a wall. Um, so the, the research question at the heart of this is how do you ex exhibit performance, but more particularly, how do you exhibit indigenous performance paying respect to the cultural knowledges that are attendant upon the performance practices that you want to show to the rest of the public. Um, we see this as an experiment. We understand that it, not all of it will be successful but we hope that a lot of it is. Um, so let me just give you a tiny bit of background to the project. I will come back to this image at the very end. Uh, okay. So the broader project is called Indigeneity in the Contemporary World, Performance Politics Belonging. It has been funded from um, the European Research Council from the uh, 2009 to next year, 2014 and uh, you'll see our website address up there. The remit of this project uh, was both to undertake research on indigenous performance cultures, it's very much focused on performance, um, and at the same time to build research capacity among early career researchers in the arts. And those people there that you see that are part of my team are the early career researchers that I recruited from um, both Britain and Europe and various parts of the world. We have had on our team in various capacities over the four, four years that we've run so far, um, both indigenous researchers from Canada, from New Zealand, from um, Latin America, and non-indigenous researchers from various other places, Australia. Uh, I'm Australian myself, uh, Peru, um, Britain, so forth. So we've We've brought a lot of people together to have dialogues about the arts through this project. Our primary outputs for the European Research Council are the usual kinds of academic books, articles, talks, papers, so on and so forth. But our biggest collaborative output is this exhibition. Um, we're involving something like about 40 artists. I'm never quite sure because people drop in and out on a daily basis. 
um, and uh, engaging with people from over 20 countries. So it's quite a massive undertaking, um, but a very exciting one. And uh, just sort of by way of background, so you know what the website looks like when you get there. I know you can't read this, but there are a great many pages with resources on um, both publications that we and other people have done and uh, internet sites that connect with both academic and arts organisations and then background on some of our research. So this is sort of summarising more or less what I just said. Um, our other major output is an educational DVD which we hope will be in, uh, distributed by Insight Media, um, a company in New York that uh, is primarily working in education. The kind of performances we're looking at um, are very varied and we take performance in its broadest remit to mean not just the performing arts, theatre, film and dance, but also those cultural performances that are staged with an eye to uh, attracting public attention and with some kind of what I'm calling um, dramaturgical structure, but which are more open um, and uh, elaborate events quite often, which we might not call the performing arts, things like protests especially, and a lot of the, uh, the work that we're looking at in Latin America has been indigenous protests, and the ways in which performances of culture um, mark those protests as something a little bit different from your Occupy movement or the various other kinds of uh, anti-globalisation protests that, that might occur. So we're also looking at things like um, festivals and pageants. Uh, anyone who saw the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games might remember a tall Aboriginal man with a small um, white uh, girl that we <laughs> in Australia call the next Kylette um, after Kylie Minogue. But the, 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 the recruitment of Indigenous performers for these massive global pageants uh, are a particular site, really, where certain kinds of cultural diplomacy happens. And you will have seen any of you who went to the, or saw on TV, the, the closing ceremonies for the London Olympics, that some of the Amazonian um, indigenous people were featured in those closing ceremonies, complete with green electronic headdresses. And I think we can expect from that to see quite a substantial indigenous presence in the pageantry of the 2016 uh, Olympics in Brazil. So some of our research has looked at the ways in which uh, particular indigenous groups have performed on the, that global stage for, as ambassadors of the nation, usually their host nation, but also as ambassadors of the Olympic movement in a way. Oh dear, I upset the gentleman at the back. <laughs> Um, ambassadors of the Olympic movement in promoting um, things like global Olympism, <laughs> peace, harmony, so forth. Um, so those are the sorts of things we're looking at and it's a multidisciplinary project. Okay, on to the fun bit. This might seem like quite a strange place to start a uh, contemporary talk about cultural diplomacy in London. But let me tell you just a little bit about the four Iroquois kings, or sometimes called Mohawk kings. Um, I've got the date there, 1710. Uh, these four Mohawk or Iroquois kings were recruited along with um, some of the British uh, diplomats and forces in the, the, um, the, what we're now calling the USA to come over to London to try and um, gather resources to fight against the French um, in North America. And the four kings came to London. They were not called kings in the US, of course. They were called um, chiefs. They came to London. They were taken out to see Macbeth, um, which is a really fascinating kind of cross-cultural instance there. One wonders what they made of it. And they were... Um, introduced to members of parliament. They were part of the delegation that came to source more resources, more troops, more money um, to, to go and fight in, um, in the New World. And um, the National Gallery held a 
exhibition in 2009 um, that included these four Iroquois kings. I see these, these kings as early diplomats in a way and just thinking about the ways in which indigenous cultures um, have participated in diplomatic conversations I think is very interesting. There are a great number of very different portraits painted or sketched of these Iroquois kings and I look at this as a performance scholar and a researcher as being a kind of example of the ways in which the Iroquois chiefs performed certain notions of royalty, of king, being a king as part of their visit to London. So there's a very long history and this is just one example of indigenous people being involved in the diplomatic relations, if we can call them that, of this country. And I think that's quite a fascinating context. It's not what we're talking about in our exhibition directly, but it is the context. It's, it's what I call this sort of ghosted presence of Indigenous people in this building, in other buildings, in this city. And I think it's very interesting to think about that. Just a couple of other examples here. Um, most of you will be familiar with the Wild West shows that toured in America, in Europe, in Britain. Um, here's just uh, one little example of the Wild West show at the American Exhibition in uh, 1887. It's, I, I couldn't make this any bigger, sorry, but um, Queen Victoria meets Buffalo Bill, who was the entrepreneur who, who toured um, the, uh, the indigenous people that he had in his performance troupe, and an Indian girl and a, a um, grown uh, chief called Red Shirt. They are not given names here, and I was not I'm sure I could find out those names, but I'm not really a theatre historian. So another example of certain kinds of historical traces of cultural diplomacy. And quite often, Indigenous people have um, not only been the, the representatives, the ambassadors of their own nations, um, their own Indigenous nations, the Iroquois, the Mohawk, whoever it may be, but also the ambassadors of the nation state. And when we get to the contemporary arts, that's a really uh, important and um, salient aspect of the ways in which Indigenous theatre and performance and art circulates. Um, in just about a month's time, the Royal Academy here in London will be having an exhibition they're calling Australia. There is a huge proportion of Aboriginal Australian art in that exhibition. Uh, a much higher proportion uh, than you will see within Australia, within most exhibitions. So the, the minute um, a group of works gets toured abroad in a festival or an exhibition, indigeneity becomes the signifier that makes Australia distinct from you know, other Western nations who, who are part of the, the, um, the kind of global circuit of westernised countries. So indigeneity is something that we draw on all the time to brand ourselves when we're abroad and um, high commissions do this very, very frequently. Um, at, but it's something that within the nation state doesn't always get the same kind of respect. Um, something to keep in mind. Okay, so when I was asked to think about cultural diplomacy, mm -hmm. Um, adapting it to my interests and my topics, these are the sort of four things that I thought would, would be of interest to you and to me. I'm not going to talk about them in any great um, depth. What I am going to do is show you some images of the, the uh, performance groups that we will represent in some way in the exhibition and I think you'll gather from just the description of the groups which will be much more interesting I hope to you. Uh, how some of these conceptual uh, issues come into play. So I've just got them up there. You can read them. The role of Indigenous performance in strengthening intercultural relations. I should also add there, in sometimes um, working to modify, challenge uh, some of the stereotypes and the norms that accompany uh, our ideas about intercultural relations with Indigenous peoples. Indigenous arts as a means for cultural understanding, pretty straightforward, the, the same sort of thing that intercultural arts work I think always does or tries to do. 
Um, so part of the dialogue log comes into that. And one of the ones that I've become very, very interested in as part of my research has been the role of art and culture in fostering a global community and particularly a global indigenous community. Um, and this is becoming extremely important in uh, our present time as we start to grapple with the scarcity of certain kinds of resources at a global level and as we start to look at the ways in which multinational companies need to begin to negotiate with Indigenous peoples who quite often own the resources um, that many Western countries need. And the role of social media in fostering a, a global Indigenous community has become extremely interesting in my field of research because it's a way of bypassing the nation state and some of the Western um, festival circuits and setting up cultural relationships between, for example, um, Aboriginal Australians, First Nations um, in Canada, Native Americans and so forth. And I see that as a different kind of community. But of course it's also um, very much to do with diplomacy. Okay. Um, so these are just a few images I want to show you to sort of ground some of the things I've been saying about the ways in which uh, Indigenous performance work acts as a, um, an ambassador for the nation. In the top left-hand corner there, a little tiny bit indistinct, I'm sorry, um, Sydney 2000 Ga Olympic Games. The Aboriginal dancers you see there behind the small um, white girl, Nikki Webster, who was the kind of mythological figure of young Australia becoming um, a, a, cult a, a cultural and sophisticated nation. Those Aboriginal dancers, a thousand of them drawn from Northern Australia, um, Arnhem Land, and a great deal of uh, work gone into the um, recruiting of the dancers, the training of the dancers in the communities and then in Sydney and then the presentation to the world in this global um, spectacle of a kind of snapshot of Australia. And of course here, Indigenous art is doing the diplomatic work of presenting Australia as a cosmopolitan nation, as a nation which um, has good relationships with its Indigenous people, as a nation that's, in this case, working towards reconciliation, which was the sort of global overarching narrative of those ceremonies. Clearly there are pluses and minuses to um, participation in this kind of global spectacle. And I don't actually see it as my job to come down on one side or the other. I simply see it as my job to analyse what those um, benefits are and what some of the, um, the risks or dangers are for the stereotyping of Indigenous cultures or for the containment of Indigenous cultures only within a certain paradigm, if you like, which is about spectacle. Um, the, the picture on the bottom left is the Vancouver Olympics opening ceremony. You can't see the figures distinctly there, but you can see the beautiful ice totem poles. I was, uh, I had the privilege of attending that opening ceremony, probably the one and only of my life. I'm not sure I'd want to do it again, but it was fascinating and uh, I was really made aware of the labour and effort um, at issue in the dancing by the Indigenous cultural groups, which were a great proportion of the First Nations of Canada, um, who came into the arena and who danced in these spectacular and wonderful costumes, probably for the best part of an hour, non-stop, while the parade of athletes goes around and. Um, the, uh, there's certain explanations made of specific cultures during the, the formal parts of the ceremony and in this case in Vancouver an unprecedented uh, collaboration with the four host First Nations of the, the territories on which the Vancouver Olympics were held. These were the Winter Olympics in 2010. Um, each of those four First Nations um, had representatives to welcome the world. So they have an audience of something like three billion people, I think it is, maybe a little bit smaller for the Winter Olympics. And to speak in their own languages, the Lilwat, the Musqueam, um, the Slayawatooth, and 
Oh my goodness, I've forgotten the other one. It'll come to me. Uh, so, so this kind of intercultural dialogue on a massive glo global scale is happening. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly one-sided dialogue, I see this one, because it's, it's a kind of um, putting out there of some of the more traditionalist aspects of indigenous cultures without much of an opportunity for uh, people to question uh, just what sort of cultural work is being done. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, these days, especially with social media, you get a lot of dialogue about um, what's at issue for Indigenous people. And the other part of what was at issue here was a massive investment into um, sport and cultural facilities and arts for Indigenous people as part of this collaboration to host the Olympics. On the right-hand side, we're moving into what we see more commonly, uh, particularly in places like Australia now, almost every uh, state festival will have significant Indigenous content. And then some of that content is picked up and circulated uh, at various festivals throughout the globe, things like Edinburgh, um, London International Festival, uh, Berlinial, you know, films, performances picked up and circulated. Um, this group, Marageku, that you see on the right with the stilts, um, are a particular group that I've been following for probably about four years now and they will be performing in London as part of a festival that works alongside my, my exhibition in October um, and it's fabulous performance and it'll be advertised very soon at the place, it's dance theatre, dance theatre work and um, I'm very proud to say I've been instrumental in um, helping that come to London. This particular um, Spring Lantern Parade, we hope will be presented, not quite sure if I'll be able to describe this properly, but as um, a strip, probably, I'm not quite sure how wide, maybe about this wide, that hangs from the ceiling that you can enter into. So a circular strip, a panorama that prints um, the parade all the way around, and then you walk in as an audience member and you might be able to see the parade and then parts of that will be animated to light up depending on where you're standing and in the middle some of the very small scale little lanterns that you see, not the big one in the sky because it's too fragile to bring here but the small ones that the, um, the festival goers are holding with some moving projections of the, um, of the work. That will develop. We currently, we were funded to um, make an interactive version of this exhibition and the interactivity goes into animating some of the exhibits, so not all of them, probably only about four or five, so that when the audience members walk in, something happens and the exhibits sort of come alive in a small way, um, almost as if you were there as part of it. Um, the other part of the interactivity um, will possibly be through a mobile application where people can track um, histories of these performances as they, as they watch the, um, the small part that we've been able to install. Um, this is another uh, performance that will be represented in part in the exhibition. On your right there is a Maori performance artist called Victoria Hunt who does installation work that's using her own um, performance training, usually not necessarily sort of as part of theatre pieces, but in galleries, um, museums and so forth. She is also performing a dance piece as part of the, uh, the festival that's going alongside this exhibition. It's called the Origins Festival of First Nations. And uh, that will be a very different piece to this one because the, the dance is um, very dynamic. The effect of this piece is to remind audiences of the ways in which Indigenous people were exhibited across the 19th century in particular, but into the 20th century um, in various parts of the world. And this is meant to be both a haunting reminder and a kind of breaking out of some of that exhibition space. You'll recall that the title of this talk is Out of the Exhibition. So there's a kind of play on those words. These things are coming out of 
the idea, or coming from, I should say, the idea of e exhibitions, but they're also, I hope, moving out of exhibition, the exhibition space in its conventional um, framework and into a more performative space. Victoria has a particularly, uh, a particularly interesting history uh, in relation to Britain because her ancestors owned a place called Hinamihai, which you see there on the left, the um, Marae or Maori meeting house. And uh, Hinamihai was bought to Clandon um, Park in the UK in the 19th century. As, and it, it was bought whole and it's there now for as part of a National Trust um, property and has been the subject to very long-going uh, dialogues about repatriation, although it's unlikely to be, to be repatriated to New Zealand. And part of uh, Victoria's visit will be to go to visit uh, Hinamihai and as the ambassador for her, for her Maori nation to interact with that, that building and to visit her ancestors and so forth. Um, this is uh, another performance piece that we'll be showing as part of the festival that we're involved in. Uh, this is coming from the same company that you saw, I'll just go back on your right there, Marageku. Um, so that's some of their work. This one is a intimate dance solo piece that will happen at the place. It's inspired by the warning song of the Gawaii bird, which inhabits the beaches of Broome. The Gawaii bird um, calls when the tide's coming in, and this particular dance theatre piece responds to the idea of ecological damage, sustainability, um, the idea that we, we need to think about um, the ways in which indigenous cultural knowledges can tell us something about uh, the environment more generally and how those cultural knowledges can be communicated through the arts, through dance, through performance um, and particularly how they also relate to in many cases the fragility of indigenous communities themselves, the loss of indigenous languages, uh, all of those sorts of things are seen as part of a broader brief about sustainability in both this performance and in the exhibition that we are doing. Okay, nearly to the end, um, and then I'd be very happy to take questions. Um, some of you might recognise the police uniform here. Um, as part of our work, we have had some visiting artists. This is uh, a great artist and um, now friend of my project who came for three weeks a few months ago and uh, was an artist and researcher in residence. Peter is from the Toltan Nation in British Columbia, Canada. And we asked him to simply create some performances or artworks while he was here in London with us, depending on how he responded to the experience of being here. And it was his first time in London. Um, but of course, he can also trace back through his ancestors um, both dialogues with um, British settlers and in colonialists and colonisers and also um, visits from his nation to Britain. So there's been a long history of a dialogue there. Um, Peter made that beautiful button blanket that he's wearing. He calls that his armour. So he set out with his armour um, to do some cultural performances around London. He called it cultural graffiti and what his idea behind cultural graffiti is, is that he would sing to major monuments, Buckingham Palace, um, the People's Princess Monument there. He went to the Magna Carta Monument. He went to the Totem Pole in Windsor Park. And he sang into the buildings, into the wood, into the iron gates, into the, um, the structures of this city. Of course, this graffiti is invisible. Um, we recorded a, a lot of this um, performance, but as you go around these places in London, we, you will not see it. What we hope from the exhibition is that people who see some of the video footage and some of the um, photo essay that we will have of Peter's performances in the exhibition, we hope that they might then just 
visit those places in a slightly different way, to listen, perhaps, to imagine some of the ghosts in the building. Um, so I see this as a different kind of cultural diplomacy. I think it's still about intercultural dialogue, understanding, um, but it's something with an interventionist edge. And I think we should start to think about cultural diplomacy as being something that should have an interventionist edge, that's not simply about easy dialogues between nations, but that can be about the difficult dialogues that we need to have, particularly over uh, things like how, how easily artists can cross borders, work in other places. I'm sure a lot of you uh, have been interested in those areas and perhaps even experienced yourself some of the difficulties. We certainly have in our project, I call the UK Border Agency as one of our stakeholders, not in a nice way, I'm afraid. <laughs> that might be the bit you don't want to record. Um, here's an example of another intervention. Um, there is a large Maori community in London, a lot of whom are artists. I don't know how many of you are Londoners or would know that. Um, but this Maori community are often called upon for multicultural events in London, particularly indigenous events. We've begun to work with a uh, wonderful Pacifica artist, she calls herself Rosanna Raymond, whose work will also be uh, featured in the exhibition. And um, I've given this, this photograph a caption. We took Rosanna Raymond and Alex Wells, who's, sorry, I'll come back to Alex, our other indigenous sort of feature artist at the, the exhibition, to Canary Wolf, uh, Wharf for a photo shoot. Some of you will know that Canary Wharf is the business precinct of London. So we went there at five o'clock in the afternoon to do a little intervention. And uh, when we sat in the restaurant around the table, nobody took any notice of us. As soon as Alex and Rosanna got their regalia, their gear on, we were pounced on by three security guards. <laughs> and who said Alex obviously wasn't from here and he'd better leave because he clearly wasn't involved in um, you know, the business activities of Canary Wharf. We talked them into letting us stay. They particularly didn't like us photograph him, him in Can Canary Wharf. And it's outside public space. So after that, we took him to the underground um, and got a few runs of photos before we were thrown out of there as well. Um, I called this particular photo Three-time world champion hoop dancer Alex Wells joins uh, afternoon rush hour on the London Underground, Canary Wharf, 2013. Um, back to Rosanna briefly just before I finish up. So Rena Rosanna does a lot of work um, in London. I, she sees herself very much as both... Uh, carrying out her artistic practice here and connected to her Samoan roots and the Pacific, um, Pacific community in London. And she's very often called upon to be an ambassador um, for anything Pacifica, Maori, um, so forth in London. So there's another kind of diplomacy happening here. Rosanna, Rosanna's work always has a subtle edge to it. Um, I've included this photo just, um, it's a photo I took personally myself on a visit to Chile as part of this research and it was a reminder to me of the ways in which we need to keep taking account of the kind of work that art does as diplomacy, um, not only in those um, highlighted and well advertised festival moments in places like London, but also in the moment, um, and especially in response to particular uh, political and social crises. I'd actually gone to the parliament buildings in um, Santiago, Chile, because there's a big art museum very close to there, and I was supposed to be meeting a friend. I went to the wrong side of the building and got lost, and ran into this um, protest fortuitously because it was exactly what I would have wanted to run into. 
So I left the friend behind and kept him waiting for quite some time. This small protest was by the um, Mapuche in southern Chile whose lands are being encroached upon, um, who suffer land grabs by multinational logging corporations in particular, and who, who have been subject to quite repressive policies as governments attempt to um, profit from collaborations with uh, multinational companies to extract resources from Mapuche land. I can't go into the history of the Mapuche peoples here, it would take too long. Um, but this particular protest I thought was just amazing. It responded to police actually firing rubber bullets at a crowd in which children um, were part of the protest down in the southern part of Chile. A very small group had come up to Santiago and they'd gathered outside the Parliament House. And because my Spanish is very limited, I was only able to get a sort of pricey at the time, but I followed up later. And they sat outside at Parliament House and then um, did what I, I call another kind of cultural performance. This was a storytelling piece. There was a leader, a woman who'd clearly done a lot of work with children. She handed out some balls of wool to the children and one ball of wool was, for the, was blue for the rivers and one was green for the ocean and various things. And there were about four or five only balls of wool and she began to tell a story of the Mapuche history and the importance of their relation to the land. And then the children threw the balls of wool to somebody else across the circle. And you can see that it created this web, this weave. And then eventually they rose and they walked in procession along with the weave. So this is a performance of culture in a very, very specific way um, that also goes with you know, the usual placards and the other things that happen when we see, um, we, we see protests. So I'm very interested as a researcher in the ways in which um, performances, art, and culture then become woven into these bigger um, political movements and the ways in which that they then connect to other movements in various parts of the world where different groups of indigenous people are also facing um, huge battles with uh, issues around resource extraction. Um, I'll end there. This is the, uh, the, the venue that we are going to install our exhibition in. It's um, just over the other side of the river down um, by the Oxo Towers between South Bank Centre and the Globe. If you walk along there behind Oxo, you'll see it. Um, it'll be on for about 15 days and in tandem with the, a festival for the first two weeks. And look for, the, um, look for the marketing. We'll be on Facebook, Twitter and just about everything else we can get on. And I know some of you may not be in London, but I hope those of you who are might be interested in coming to see what contemporary Indigenous performers are doing as um, cultural diplomats and as artists in their own right. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Peter. I think you have... Um presentation is uh, raising a great number of questions to uh, those uh, engaged in cultural diplomacy and uh, would you call yourself uh, in one kind an activist? <laughs> oh, I suppose yes, um, quite apart from my own personal politics which have been activist. Uh, I would never have really thought of myself in that way until this project started. I have to say that the exhibition was an afterthought when I was putting in for the funding because primarily the European Research Council uh, is um, tasked to fund cutting edge research and it only, I put in sort of a, a slice of funding for the exhibition because I thought we need to reach the public somehow. But at that point, I didn't 
really know what form the exhibition will, would take. I conceived it more as being something that would be about our research, um, which does include some Indigenous researchers on the team. We have a, a Maya anthropologist on our team as well as um, various other Indigenous people. But I did conceive it as being much more of a sort of academic, educational kind of exhibition. And that's sort of what I budgeted for. Then as the work grew and we carried out the dialogue that we needed to have as part of our research with the people who were making the art and the protests and being part of the performances, we felt more and more strongly that we didn't want the exhibition to be about our research. We wanted it to be first and foremost about their art. And that even though we were tasked to um, put our research into the, into the public realm, that the best way to do this was to do it via an inquiry that is what I call practice-based research. So we've got a research question that researches how do you exhibit performance, how do you exhibit Indigenous performance with an eye to keeping intact the cultural conventions, knowledges, aesthetics um, that are part of that performance. So that's the research question. The proof will be in the pudding in a sense. We did of course have to go and find more money in order to both expand that and um, to, to get live people here. And we've been working with embassies, cultural funding bodies, Australia Council, Canada Council, um, societies, all sorts of people. It was never really part of my original brief to actually become <laughs> a, uh, a festival co-producer as I am now, um, but it's been a very interesting experience and one that even though I had no particular background in this, this um, large-scale work as a director and producer of small-scale university performances over 15, 20 years, I know how to put on a show, basically. So, um, so it's been a great challenge and very exciting. And I, I do see it as activist work. I see the arts as inherently having the potential for activism. And that doesn't mean to say it has th that the activism has to make it dry and boring. In fact, anything but. I think it gives it an edge. You only have to look at this picture here you can read the activism. I don't know if you can read the subtitle. Sorry, I couldn't make this any bigger. The subtitle is Performance and Provocation in Our Times. And I really want to stress that this is for our times and that we need to think about Indigenous communities as a globally connected network that have a lot to offer to the arts. And the way you uh, open doors with the European Research Council giving uh, the recognition to your work. Yes. And that is uh, a great achievement as it's very difficult to have financing. It was the first um, arts project to be funded by the European Research Council at the time. Don't quote me on this. Um, I did wonder if the reason why they'd agreed to fund me was because they thought it was anthropology, not arts. Um, because we, we see everywhere in our research a tendency for people to think as soon as they see indigenous people that it's anthropology. I didn't bother to, tell, to set them straight on that. I thought, this is good. I'll show them that it's arts, not anthropology. <laughs> But there obviously were some assessors who understood very well, otherwise I would never have got the money. <laughs> would you say uh, Aborigines are only located in uh, mainly Australia, or uh, don't you see them also living in uh, Europe? Look, there are Aboriginal artists practicing, or uh, Aboriginal Australian artists practicing all over the world, if that's what you mean by Aboriginal. Um, there's a guy doing a PhD at Oxford who's a visual artist. There's, um, as I said, the Maori community has uh, artists here in London. Some of you may have heard of the filmmaker Tracy Moffat who works out of New York. Um, and, and in fact, indigenous people who are um, top artists tend to be outside of their countries of origin often because they've gone abroad to make careers. 
will often come back to their countries of origin. Um, the term indigenous, I probably should have explained that at the beginning. It's a term that it's both problematic and convenient. Within their own communities, the people that we are working with will call themselves by their um, particular band or group or affiliation or tribe, so they would not generally call themselves indigenous. They would call themselves, as you saw, Taltan Nation or Maori or, um, you know, the Pichinjara people or whoever. But, uh, and then within their nation, they will probably have a more general term like Aboriginal for Australian, Native American for the US, First Nations for Canada, Indigena in certain parts of Latin America, or it could be something else. But the term indigenous on a global scale is something that's been recognised or promoted by um, the United Nations and that becomes then a, an umbrella that has as many useful sort of linkages as it has problematic associations because it is rather homogenising. It does tend to suggest that there, there are too many equivalences between some very, very different groups and agendas. Um, but it's the term we chose for our exhibition and our work because of its international reach and its transnational links. And most of the global networks will go under the word indigenous. And of course, you know, there are all kinds of debates about who's indigenous and who isn't. Um, Britain has its own indigenous communities and defines them differently depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to some of the Celts or um, people from Scotland, that term has also become useful. For them, it's also become dangerous and problematic in the, the hands of right-wing um, sort of groups who, who wish to appropriate the term indigenous for um, white populations as a way of keeping out non-white groups. So we, we realise that our audiences, some of them won't have a clue what the term means. We hope by the time, we hope we can draw them into the exhibition and by the time they finish, they may have engaged in some kind of cultural dialogue. And we will have some live performances as part of the exhibition, very small scale. I just want to say, like, I really appreciate what you did. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, the way you link in the theory with um, kind of the artistic notions and being extremely abrasive with what you're doing in the artwork, I just think it's absolutely fantastic and a much needed necessity right now. I mean, I do sustainable development, and it's amazing to see stuff like that. Thank you. That's what, you know, Please come to our exhibition. Please talk to me later. <laughs> so, no question. Come on. Thank you. Uh, you? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for all this information and the uh, activity that you've done. So, my question would be how we thought um, to be part of your project? How is the criteria to be part uh, of your project? That you mean that you, you said uh, that you had engagement with 20 countries, and uh, as I understood, and also you organized thought activities. Yeah. Um, we are just about to launch our Twitter and Facebook. We, we already have a Twitter. I probably can't see it. Oops. Um, if you go to our web page, you'll see just some updates. Uh, oh, this doesn't show up on that one. That must be an old version. Anyway, on that, if you go to the web page I gave, on the website, um, down in the bottom right hand corner there's some tweets from our Maya anthropologist actually who tweets pretty pretty regular. He'd love more followers so he's building up some followers. Um, and he tweets about the project as a whole. He tweets about you know indigenous um, protests in Brazil or a performance that's here in London or wherever and he's, he's quite connected with the Latin American community in various parts of the world. And then our um, Indigenous Canadian, Dylan Robinson, he's not yet on Twitter, but he's on Facebook, and I think we're about to talk him into 
going on Twitter and our own Twitter we're starting up um, that we'll link with uh, this is the banner for our Facebook page actually we have a bigger poster for the exhibition it'll be launched within about two weeks um, and we'll link this to our indigeneity website as well and then a couple of my team will actually run the Facebook page and we sort of work outwards from my team is vastly connected. I have connections in Australia and Canada mostly, but a little bit elsewhere. And then the Canadians have their group. And then I have a um, PhD student who's part of this project from South Africa. So we'll bring all that together as part of our um, project campaign for the exhibition. And then we'll, um, just this morning I was um, talking with the Australian High Commission about getting posted on their web page and so it's sort of in the typical kind of both ad hoc well slightly ad hoc but also the strategy is to kind of connect work first through our connections so if anybody would like to offer any further connections that would be great and will be advertised on the barge house um, website which uh, appears as part of the south bank um, group of venues as well and um, so there'll be lots of sort of ways to to plug in. But the, the way to find out about it will be to go to our website. I don't even have the, I don't use Twitter actually, or, or Facebook. <laughs> I might be about to start, but um, my job as project leader is to draw on the resources of the wonderful old and young people that I'm working with. So um, my job is to have the vision in a sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So I uh, want you to thank uh, again Professor Dr. Gilbert and uh, we hope to be able to see, to visit your exhibition and anyway we uh, shall stay in contact with you. Thank you. Technology. I'd love you to come and look at the, because the, the interactive work we're doing, I mean, we don't even quite know what that will be yet. We've hired, I think, an absolutely inspirational artist to do that. Um, and she's working, she's British, she's working with a Canadian um, mobile app designer and some um, Canadian um, theatre makers to, to do things like a three-dimensional diorama, a small one, the big panorama that I talked to you about. So there's, we're trying to sort of get some of the magic through sound, um, through visuals of what it might have been like to be there, even though you can't be there. And of course, there's lots of video footage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I've cut into your lunch hour, but we did start.